Ladies, gentlemen, everyone in the room, please welcome Steve Lamack. Morning. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, thank, thank you very much to Katie as well. Uh, thank you uh, for having us back. Uh, we tried this last year and it seemed to work, so we're going to do it again just to open up the day and try and share some of the stories, some of the challenges, uh, some of the successes and failures that uh, we all face uh, in grassroots uh, live music around the country. Uh, we are very pleased uh, to welcome. We've got six guests in all uh, representing uh, various venues uh, which make up the grassroots circuit, uh, some newish venues, some well-established places, uh, but they're all here obviously to tell their, to tell their own stories. And uh, at some point, I think during the course of the next 50 minutes, uh, you'll probably recognise some of the things uh, that you go through yourselves. So uh, please welcome all my guests onto uh, the stage, please come and join us. Here we go. We will be talking to Nick Stewart, Sam Dabb, Jay Taylor, Tony Cobrooker, Tony uh, Amber France, and uh, Paul Jackson, who's over there. We'll start with uh, Nick. Um, and obviously, at any point, if you'd like to uh, butt in, uh, you've got about 10 minutes each to tell us, to give us your version of This Is Your Life. Uh, first, Nick Stewart from Sneaky Pete's in Edinburgh, everyone. Give him a round of applause. Hello. Uh, sneak, sneaky Pete's I've been to twice this year, I think, once on the Independent Venue Week tour. Um, uh, it's a wonderfully intimate venue. I mean, I don't know if you can describe it. For people who've never been to Sneaky Pete's, tell us, if you were walking in, what do you see? I think more or less the first thing you see is the stage, because the venue is so small, so it's just a 100 capacity venue um, up in Edinburgh. It's too small to have a dressing room. Uh, you walk and what, in. what do bands say when they turn up and room and you say, nah? Do you know what? My advance is pretty good. It just says, there's no dressing room. Right. <laughs> okay. I mean, you've got a really good reputation or have built one for spotting bands on the way up, haven't you? Because you've had numerous successes where bands have played at Pete's and immediately gone on to do reasonable things. Like, even recently, I saw She Drew the Gun played at your gaff, didn't they? Yeah, and they're, they're playing nearby soon in Edinburgh as well, so it's good to see they're still touring in the same parts of the circuit. I, I like to think that, especially there's a lot of people in the room who've got venues that have been established for a long time, and I think if you're putting on enough shows, it's not that my booking is amazing, it's just that if you, know, if you throw enough darts and you, you try and choose the, the acts that you think are good personally rather than necessarily who's going to pull, then later on you will have a hit list of all the great bands that have come through. Um, and the other thing is that we work with a lot of really great promoters as well. So we have in-house shows, um, but people tend to like to use the venue. So, so we do get a lot of great acts coming through on first tours. Do you find that artists talk to each other uh, to the point where, you know, they have a good gig, say at Sneaky Pete's, they'll tell other bands, we had a, yeah, you want to go there, it's a good, it's a good gig? Yeah, well, I hope that artists, well, they tell me that they have a good time, and I do see people coming back. Um, and I think that people tend to know about the venue after a while. We, we're in our 12th year now, and I think by the time you're around on the circuit for long enough, you do get a certain amount of recognition, so it's good to see. And uh, um, with the audience as well, I, I imagine you've got, a, do, you, do you find you're always spotting faces who've been before? Well, I mean, we're, we're going through a really interesting time right now. So this, I would say the last couple of years have been the first time where we've got... I used to be able to spot one or two people who would go to almost every show in the venue. But the job of audience development that I always thought I had was to get, you know, 20 people who would go to every show no matter what. Now, it doesn't mean it's the same 20 people, but there's, yeah. if I put on a gig, I won't have an attendance in a 100-capacity venue of less than 30. And it just means that people are trusting us enough now that we can get a room where some people will be there and the band will have a good time. Yeah. That's the point I really want to get to, so I'm really glad we're, we're approaching that now. And it's been through putting on much more gigs in the last couple of years that we've really widened our audience in terms of who's willing to take a punt. Yeah. So I'm hoping the more gigs we put on, the more attendance we're going to get generally. It seems like putting on shows does improve the culture of going to shows in that city. And, I mean, we're, we're amongst friends. No one's going to tell us. Do you have any... 
Come on, you must do, don't you? Oh, the Vikings in. <sighs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> yes, he does. Uh, do, do, do you know what? Yes, I, he does. I, I have a particularly bad memory. Um, I, I sometimes nicely describe my girlfriend as my external hard drive because I've already filled this one with uh, all the possible names and faces I can put in there. And then, you know, I like give a little tap, tap on, the, on the shoulder or the wrist to say, who's that? So I can't even remember people's real names, never mind the nicknames, but maybe the nicknames would help. I once got um, taught uh, this by somebody who worked for, as it was then, the Mean Fiddler organisation, that um, if you don't know somebody's name, you have somebody, like the other, uh, if you don't know somebody's name, you just scratch your nose, and if you want to get rid of them, you just start doing this. Apologies if I've ever done that to anyone here. <laughs> What, you, does that you, mean you've got a getter ridder person? Who's that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so I mean, what, what, yourself, I'm quite interested in yourself, Nick, because y you were a sh you were a chef at one point, were you? How does he know that? Yes. So you were a chef, and then what? How did you get into promoting geeks? Were well, you still? Sh you can't do both. So what did you do? What was your route into this? Um, I, s I started putting on my own gigs, and as we all know, that doesn't make any money, so I did every job that you could do to make sure that the shows were funded. Um, I did quite a lot of work in a neighbouring venue where I was putting on gigs as the cleaner. And you go up from being the cleaner to working on the bar to the see that you're putting on some gigs and you're losing loads of money, but maybe you could book in-house for a little bit. And eventually someone I was working for found a venue that they wanted to take over and uh, installed me as a manager. Then they changed their mind after a year and a half, but it came onto the market and I got a chance to buy the lease. So that was, that was me in from quite early. I mean, you've got to be quite committed. I mean, that's quite an investment, I imagine. Did you have to find somebody to front you some I've money? got a business partner, but because it was essentially a failed business I was taking over, um, and the place is so small, um, I, I bought 50% of the value of the lease, not the building itself, and that 50% came from my dad pretending to get a loan for a new kitchen. All the tricks of the trade. Is that right? <laughs> really? Never knew that. Uh, and so, what was there anything when you first? Obviously, you just promoted some gigs, but actually, then being the person who's running the venue, were there any things you just hadn't thought about? Were there, what were the first challenges? The things that you thought, really, I hadn't thought about this, this, and this. I mean, even if it's just some of the red tape involved in terms of licensing. Oh, sure. I mean, so for we, were, we were nearly shut down in quite early days for noise complaints. Um, and we ended up doing a lot of work on that later on. We, we challenged the council and got some of the rules changed about that. So noise complaints were a big thing. Licensing generally is an issue. Um, I think that the challenges that we all share um, to do with issues about uh, just the cost of running a venue, what that means, um, how much you're able to invest in talent to bring people up, and w when you have to just make more commercial decisions to keep th things going. The things that surprised me at the start. But then I didn't expect to be around as well. I thought I'd probably give this a go and fail in a couple of years, and we seem to still be there. Yeah. And um, in terms of, you know, attracting bands, we talked about word of mouth and everything. It's, a, it's quite a... It's a I guess Glasgow gets most of the, gets a lot of the gigs, so you've had to sort of build back up Edinburgh's place on the touring circuit. By and how do you do it? Because you can't. There can't be a lot of money in it. You're a quite a small venue, so you're not going to be offering a band a lot of money to drive a very long way. No, true. And if we were just putting on gigs, then we probably wouldn't be around at all. But I've always had a really strong interest in doing club nights and doing very credible club nights as well. Right. So I know that some of the bigger venues here would have to um, keep their income going by doing big student nights or whatever Saturday night is, you know, if you've got like a two pound a pint but all the students come down kind of fairly cheesy night. That keeps venues open, that's great, but we've been privileged with our size that we're actually able to do really credible club nights where I would say most of the income comes in. So some of that funds the live music, but increasingly the live music is really standing on its own feet now as well. And that's to do with the audience development we've done. We have some crossover between the gigs and clubs now as well, which is really right. nice to see where someone who used to come to the venue quite a lot when they were younger, for the club nights, I know coming out to the gigs, and I think a lot of the venues here have probably got a problem with aging um, uh, demographic of the people who go and see the shows, and that seems to be one way we're drawing people back in to see the shows. So I'm hopefully getting a bit more of a younger crew these days. Right. Okay. So get them, get them early-ish. Yeah, when so when long you're doing something credible that ties in with yeah. the kind of music you're doing at gig time. What's um, what have been the pivotal moments for you over this decade then? Surviving the first noise complaint, I imagine, is one. But just, you know, times where you thought, 
this is a really good night. I can see where we're going now. Oh, this is probably really early, early joy stuff. Um, we, I, I wasn't at all sure that we were going to be able to make the venue we had into a music venue properly at all. So it was initially floor shows, and then the first time they actually just tried to build a stage and see what happens. And all oh, this kind of looks like a gig. Or then we went, well, well, we saved every penny we have, let's buy a proper PA. And then the first time someone comes on stage, and it suddenly looks like a real music venue. Because it never did, you know? And uh, people's idea of they walk in and like, oh, this is a music venue. You know, the, like grassroots music venue is supposed to have the elephant test. Everyone in the town thinks that it's a music venue. I can promise that no one thought it was a music venue when they first walked in in the early days of the venue. And now they, you get to a different level. So it's, it, it's, it's little notches. It's not just one. I mean, there was a great day when KT Tunstall played. Right. <laughs> and we had a queue around the block. That was actually one of the great early moments. So thank you very much, Katie. Um, thank you very much to Nick for uh, joining, being our first guest. Uh, a round of applause, please. Uh, I've got to say, it, and it is, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful little venue, and you walk, it, you walk in, and it's not just a room, is it? That's the other thing. It's, 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 a room. it's got a bar here. It's got sort of higgledy-piggledy when you walk in, and it's just immediately got a load of character, I think. You know, it's so not just a box. Thought of actually, you know, David Burns got lying about one reason why CBGBs was so good is because you can stand at the opposite end of the room and not pay attention to the band if you want to. So that helps fans get better because people aren't drawing enough attention. Then you get good enough that people suddenly sit up and take notice, which means that you can have a chat at the other end of the bar if you need to, Steve. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, well, you know me. Love a chat. Um, does anyone remember the Duchess of York in Leeds? Because that had, that had, it was two L shapes. So there was loads of places where, you, you know, particularly when it was full, could not see the band. But it was brilliant, as you say. You know, if, um, if the band were rubbish, they had a very good pinball table. Uh, <laughs> some of you obviously will remember uh, the legend of a Welsh venue called TJ's. But that's not the only Newport venue which has written its way into live music history. Uh, it's been through some turbulent times of late, although has come through these with a real sense of purpose and optimism for the future and a new building to tell us about Le Pub or Le Public Space. Sam Dabb, everybody. Hi. Sam, Sam, Sam Blesser uh, gave us a copy of a, a record earlier on by the band she was in in 1994 and said, you played that. So you must have been all right. I can't, or what or did... Did that play on the evening session, put the kibosh on, on your band? Was that the end? I thought we were great, but I'm not sure anybody else did. Right. <laughs> and what did, you, what did you sound like in 1990s? Um, I guess we used to sound a bit like shampoo, but before shampoo. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really Two annoying girls dancing around and singing high-pitched. Where would... Did you grow up around Newport? Yeah. So where, would, where did you go to your first gig? My first gig was Newport Centre. Was it? Ned's Atomic Dustbin. <laughs> Ned's Atomic Dustbin. Newport Centre, that's, I mean, it's big and like a sports hall, isn't it, essentially? So what about the first small gig? I mean, were, were you a, a regular at the TJ's at one point? Yeah, I used to go to TJ's a lot. I'm down by Law and Sam I Am in TJ's, I think, was one of the first I went to. Really? Yeah, Operation Ivy in TJ's. Definitely shouldn't have been in there. <laughs> <laughs> and when, when did you decide you wanted to be involved in live music then? And did it come about... In the same way, I started writing a fanzine because I thought the enemy was rotten and everyone else didn't understand music. So it was a kind of, you know, it was that uh, slightly obstinate, opinionated arrogance of youth which led me into it. Was it similar with you? My parents always had pubs and I always worked in them. And then um, I think about six months after the pub opened, I went in and asked for a job. And the guy that was running it said, no way, because I was drunk in there most nights <laughs> and then uh, six months after that he was desperate hired me just for the Christmas period don't think you've got a full-time job and 26 years later I'm still there and he's not <laughs> tell, um, tell us about Le Pub because um, it's one of those places I've always seen in gig listings and it seems to do some really interesting music sometimes a little you, you, you know you see names of strange punk bands and, and things you think Wow, well, well, well done. I bet there's a little scene built around around this. It's what what's what was the what's the thinking? You know, the manifesto behind it. Is there one? We do anything. Right. We will put on anything. We have, we, for example, one of our club nights. It's uh, 
no genre snobbery. If it's a banger, we'll play it. It doesn't matter if it's pop, it doesn't matter if it's punk. And we have the same with the bands. We do, for example, on Saturday, we had a spoken word and theater evening on a Saturday night. And then on a Wednesday night, you've got pulled apart by horses and it, there's no genre snobbery whatsoever. If it's good, we'll put it on. Are you, are you aware that you are a sort of lifeline for people? I don't know, how far would you have to go? If, if your venue wasn't there, how far would people have to travel to see a live band? I suppose it's only Cardiff, which isn't that far. But I think for the people in Newport, it's really important. It gives like them their own identity. Because in the 90s, Newport had a huge musical identity. And I think the pub existing is really important in terms of making sure we still hold on to that. Yeah. And with, without it, there, I mean, there wouldn't be... Well, obviously, there's nowhere to go, but no bands, no, no nowhere for people to share ideas, I guess, is it? No, I don't think so. I think it's a massive creative hub in the city. Um, moving things, I mean, you've, you've had problems to overcome. First of all, at the old venue, you had to, you, again, noise complaints. Didn't you have to soundproof the roof? Yeah, we had to raise 17,000 and soundproof the roof. How, how did you go about that? Um, we had a load of fundraising gigs. McCluskey reformed and did a fundraising gig for us, which was amazing. We also um, sold off plaques above the urinal for £100, so you could buy a plaque to go above the urinal. Really? So, yeah, and toilet door cubicles, you could have your own toilet. And, yeah, little <laughs> things like that. We sold jumpers, T-shirts. Really? How long did it take in the, in the end? Like three weeks. <laughs> did it? Yeah. Really? That yeah. shows you how enthusiastic we're was, people, appreciative of people are. Then. It was a massive community thing as well, because as soon as the McCluskey show sold out, and I think it was about four minutes, Welsh Club got in touch, Club Eiffel Bach, and they hosted one and gave us all the money from that as well. So it was a massive Welsh music venues coming together to look after each other thing. Yeah. And so you overcame that, but then you come to a point, was it put up for sale? What was the, because there comes a point where you Yeah, the lease was up and the landlady was retiring. I wish right. she'd told me that before I spent so much money on the roof. But <laughs> for 18 months after we did the roof, she decided she wasn't going to renew our lease. So what, what's, you, you, you've got a sort of committee of people together then to try and brainstorm what to do next because... Yeah, we, um, we set up a community benefit society. Right. So we have 67 shareholders who raised, well, they've, they've, it's not raising money because it's not like a funding, it's actually their shareholders. And we had £43,000, which enabled us to take a lease on a much bigger building and then turn it from a derelict mess into a usable space. And of those people, are they all involved in music or are they just uh, arts people, local benefactors? Arts people, local people. Some people just like the fact that there's somewhere nice to go for a beer. The best thing about it, though, is there's plumbers and there's electricians and there's tradesmen, and I can just send an email out to the shareholders saying, my toilet's blocked. And someone will reply, well, I'll yeah, be there Not the one in the venue, just the one at home. Yeah, just come to my house. <laughs> but yeah, and I'll send an email out, and nine times out of ten, someone will respond with, yeah, I'll be there this afternoon. And it's like this huge bank of community that you can call on to keep your place open. In all this, what are your local council like? They supported? Really good. I've are got they? a great re relationship with the council. Really, really good. Mainly because our head of licensing has been drinking in the pub for 20 years. So he's, <laughs> yeah, he's really on our side. <laughs> so, it, so did you, had you identified when you started to think, well, we're going to move because we want to be a bit more ambitious and this place is, you know, the old lady's a bit dilapidated now. Did, had you already identified a new venue to go to? No, we looked at about six and there was one that we really liked, but the roof was completely gone. And even though it was a uh, lease, the landlord wanted us to fix it. And it was the dream. And every venue we went to just wasn't as good as that one. And then I was walking past one day and someone was doing the roof. So just out of interest, I phoned the estate agent to find out who was taking it. And he said, oh, no one's taking it. The landlord's finally accepted. He has to fix it. So I instantly rang everybody on our steering committee and went, oh, we have to get an intent to lease now. And yeah, that was, that's where it all began. Still needs some work, though. You were saying that um, it's a lovely building, but part of it is still uninhabitable. Yeah, the ground floor that we took on was absolutely horrific. It was like 12-hour days for six weeks just to turn it around, and we managed that. There was, I think we took three bin bags of dead pigeons to the tip. <laughs> no idea what to do with them. It was absolutely horrific. <laughs> I, do you know General what? waste. I bet, I, I, I know it's very comprehensive, the new book about how to run a grassroots venue, but I bet it doesn't have anything about pigeons for the, for the updated edition. 
Yeah, we've got three more floors upstairs that are in the same state that that was, if not worse, because the floors are rotten, and there isn't even any stairs at the moment. Right. So. <laughs> so, but um, the the ambition would be then all to three floors. All yeah. three floors. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, how how exciting? Because you, there must be a time where you know when you're running the pub, you're keeping the place open. But now there's a whole new potential of what you can do, which must be. Yeah, it is really exciting. Right. It's just sometimes you just lie awake thinking about what am I going to put in this room, what am I going to put in that room, and yeah. it constantly changes, and it's just, it, yeah, it does keep you going. And in the meantime, um, audience is good. Have you found they, they go up and up They and go down up and down. It, yeah, it's you can get four people in for a gig that you thought you'd get 100 in for, and you can get 100 people into a gig you thought no one was coming to. And what have you been your favourite times being involved in live music, then your own personal favourites? Gigs you've been involved with rather than gigs you've been drunk at? Um, there's a band from America called Larry and His Flask, and we put on one of their first UK gigs, and they're hands down the greatest band and the greatest people. Absolutely amazing. I think it's really hard to pull it into one experience because they all bleed into one just really great time. Yeah. Would you, do, you, do you recommend it to people where be, being involved in live music? Because uh, It depends if you want to be rich or not. Because if you want to make money, then no, definitely not. But yeah. if you want to have a really, really, like, I love my life, I have a great time. Is there, is there one thing that would make your life easier as a venue promoter, as a venue? There's a, f there's a few um, business rates. I don't see why we have to pay them. Most art spaces don't pay them, so why do grassroots music venues? And that is a massive chunk of our income that we could then invest into the venue. It's not about making money for the shareholders, it's about, you know, yeah. that's a massive chunk of money we could put into starting upstairs or doing new toilets and things. Well, we wish you all the best with, uh, with your future plans and getting the, getting the next floors done. Uh, long live the public space. Ladies and gentlemen, Sam Dabb. <laughs> Our next featured venue. Well, I mean, it's not been an easy time, uh, this one either, really, for, but for different reasons, uh, a round of applause. From Manchester's Night and Day Cafe, this is Jake Taylor. Um, well, it's, uh, we were just talking about this downstairs, but obviously uh, the man behind the Night and Day, it's very nearly, it's about a year, isn't it, yeah. since uh, Jan Oldenburg passed <coughs> away, we, uh, which, as you know, you described him as a larger than life figure. I mean, it must be frightful for everyone involved in that place just to suddenly, just the gap caused by his, you know, the absence of his presence. Yeah, so I mean, um, Jan was, uh, he was the perfect uh, um, combination of being extremely smart, like extremely strange, but extremely uh, um, enthusiastic. He was an extraordinary human being. Um, sort of like a defining person in my life, I suppose. Um, and yeah, so uh, very strange, because when somebody passes away very quickly and out of the blue, you've kind of got a show the next day. Yeah. And so it's a strange thing. Yeah, yeah. And what's, um, you, um, I don't know, what, what will people remember him for? I mean, he left behind a great legacy, though, didn't he? I mean, that place, obviously, the actual place. But there's something about him and an attitude, I think, which people will always remember. Sure. I mean, I think if you were, if you, when you walk in night and day, it doesn't particularly feel like a lot of the Mancunian venues. I mean, what happened was after the Hacienda and Dry were built and uh, Ben Kelly did those sensational design jobs on those buildings, there was a wave of venues who you thought, bricks and girders. And so endless bricks and girders, you know, and I suppose it's quite an easy thing to do yeah. if you don't want to spend a load of money. And night and day is not like that at all. It's full of crap <laughs> you know I didn't I didn't know that when he bought it it was a chip shop it was a chip shop called Pisces and so when he bought it he signed a lease in um, in uh, 1991 so it'll be 28 in November and um, with always with the intention of, of it becoming what it ultimately did but because he had no money and, uh, and, and times are hard. And also, Oldham Street was derelict and nobody really wandered up and down Oldham Street. It would be ill-advised. He, um, he slowly did things. And so it was a chippy that sort of ended up putting gigs on at night and then it didn't have a liquor license, so he used to get booze in teapots. And, and he sort of found a way. 
he was, he was stubborn, was Jan, and, uh, and, and it worked. That's brilliant, isn't it? I mean, it, it does have... I think the... the I don't know. The, it, it has such a friendly atmosphere, though, that I, I, maybe it's because it grew into a venue, but it still feels... It's still got a bit of the sort of almost jazz club or cabaret venue about it. If you yeah, I mean, know. I think a lot of people walk in and, and immediately think, particularly American bands, think it looks like a big New York bar, a big Chicago bar. It's got a big, long bar down one stage and a stage at the end. But essentially, it's not that at all, because Jan was Dutch. It's his take on, on a Dutch bar. You know, he's from The Hague. And so his idea was it probably was, it did fit in Holland more, but it probably does have, have that a bit more kind of pizzazz, perhaps. And also, you know, we don't... It's not often touched upon, but because we're a cafe during the day, uh, and, and I, I never get asked about this, it, it, it's, it's sort of become a safe space for oddballs. Yeah. So, there's, so a bunch of people come... Um, who who find it sort of calming and unpretentious, I suppose. Yeah. And do the do the oddballs clear out in the evening, or the oddballs just some of the oddballs aren't interested in the shows, and some yeah. of them stick around. Yeah. Some yeah. of them, you know, some of them start work. What's a? <laughs> <laughs> it's. I mean, it's. Have you got any nickname? No, that's fine. Uh, it's a classic story, though, isn't it, uh, in a way? that, um, uh, And it's happened in different places in London, as you say. It was a bit sketchy, that area, when it was when it, uh, Jan took it over. Mm. But there was, over the course of time, one interesting cultural thing then draws another interesting cultural thing, and before it, you have essentially the foundation of the Northern Court. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't called the Northern Quarter for starters, was it? That was, uh, you know, that was that happened later on. So I think, you know, without blowing our trumpet too hard, I think you can kind of um, place the regeneration of the Northern Quarter at three businesses. You know, uh, Affleck's Palace, which is a big multi-story sort of boutique market thing like Hyper Hyper used to be in uh, wherever the hell that was, Kensington? I forget where Hyper Hyper was. And um, Dry Bar, which factory owned, which was ne used to be next door to us, which is about to become... A hotel, how glorious. And um, and us, you know, the rest of it, apart from a couple of pubs that you didn't drink in, was boarded up. But it's generally not those big companies that make those dramatic and, and interesting choices and and, 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 uh, and make the first step in those neighbourhoods, is it? It's, it's people like Jan. Did you, uh, have you, have you um, come into, have you had the similar problems of when an area becomes slightly more fashionable, people start moving there and then complain about the things that were on their doorstep when they moved there? Sure, I mean, it happened twice, and it was difficult. Um, it, it, difficult because there probably wasn't a lot of support from the city. Some members of the city absolutely sided with the, the, the person who'd moved in next door on both occasions. You know, the support wasn't unanimous for the thing that had been there forever. And also, it stops you doing what you're supposed to be doing every day. And the thing you're supposed to be doing every day takes up a ton of time already. I mean, my phone's pinging now. I shouldn't even be here. And so, to just have to stop doing that, and then uh, day after day, and it the first one took the best part of a year to, to put to bed, to, to suddenly put part of your day aside to deal with a nitwit, is, is really annoying. Yeah, of course. <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you find, though, that, I mean, I probably you knew there was a community of people built around this thing, but in times of crisis, did you... Did you actually realise how supportive people were, like with Le Pub? Yeah, I mean, the first time sort of predates the music venue trust. The second time, I think it feels every day one of those problems happens. There's more support and more awareness. You know, the agent of change as a concept didn't exist the first time. And so the first time, we sort of floundered a little bit. I knew um, Alan North, who had the Betsy Trotwood in places. I spoke to him because he'd had uh, issues, and he talked us to it a bit. We spoke to Kelly Wood at the Musicians' Union and Fergal. And a bunch of, it was sort of, you know, we sort of had to kind of work out a way to deal with it because there was no form. At least now it feels like there's a structure in how you would deal with somebody making a noise complaint, you know, like, you know, music venue trust particularly. Has, uh, has your experience doing other things in music? Because you, you've been at, um, you've been at the venue, you worked at the venue twice, haven't you? You've been at uh, <laughs> yeah. night and day twice. <laughs> once on the way up, once on the way down. I'm only joking. Uh, the, the first time was when? Um, I started in 2002 and was there four years, and then I went away and did other things. Right. Uh, did some sessions for you, and then uh, and then came back. And then you, how how were you drawn? How were you drawn back in? Okay, so um, 
I was teaching by and large, doing other bits and pieces, but largely teaching. Uh, um, and and then I kept getting these strange phone calls and missed number, missed like missed calls off numbers I didn't recognise. And it turned out to be Jan. Um, and and then it took like about a month to kind of get in the same room as him because he had these stupid small burner phones, and uh, and and his number changed. And then and so I got drawn back into a cup of coffee, and he, I sat at the bar. And then he said, "So then, when are you coming back?" And uh, and looking uh, looking you in the eye with this is fluence, <laughs> and uh, and um, you know a great band was there, and the sun was shining, and the coffee was great, you know. I said, "Oh yeah, all right." I said yes. But yeah, and it also I knew that it was probably the last thing people expected me to do, which is always what you should do, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I I go along with it. What what had you done in in the in the main? You'd you'd been out doing other music industry well, style so jobs. I was one of those people who was in a rock and roll band, and the, in the back of their head, a little voice was going, "The money's going to run out. The money's going to run out." And so even though there's some advice that says you shouldn't consider a plan B because it compromises your plan A, I I set up a load of plan Bs, and so I promoted and worked in studios and tour managed and did artist liaison and did some radio and, and did all manner of things until venue management and uh, and promoting sort of won out. So did any of those experiences help inform the way you ran a venue? Is it good to have seen things from the other side? Well, being in bands, absolutely, because, you know, you, you know how you, you would like to be treated. It, you know, that you, you understand there's empathy for the rock and roll band there straight away, isn't there? You know, I've been that guy who turned up at a venue and saw the promoter putting the posters up on the day of the show, you know. And so I absolutely understood what, what, what bands want from a show. I think so, because I'd played everywhere. TJ's. Yeah, yeah. It's, ready. Oh, it's gone. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you lost one. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the Adelphi. <laughs> At least he hasn't fallen asleep. I did a, <laughs> I did a, I did an interview once with, um, seeing as we're talking to Manchester, I did an interview with Sean Ryder when uh, the Happy Mondays first reformed, and uh, they came down to. Because the guy who was, they, they didn't have a radio plugger at the time, they only had a press officer, but the press officer had, was a guy I'd known from the NME days and had been press officer for Nirvana and Carl, the Unstoppable Sex Machine. Anyway, he phoned up and he said, but they're announcing some dates for Mondays, would you like to do an interview? So I went to, they were doing some photographs for the NME, I think, in this studio, and we went down to the studio and there was a young lad who'd only just started on the programme with us, a new assistant. He'd only been on the show about four weeks I think anyway so he sets up the kit and Sean's brilliant you know we talk we were talking through you know, you know why they're getting back together why they split up in the first place who took all the money all that sort of thing and that's where well, it's been lovely and it's great to have you back um you might as well read out the dates then uh, exclusive to Radio 1 here are the dates and so uh, he said uh, right we, s we start off in it's somewhat weird, like there's a warm up gig in like Hereford, we do Hereford, then we do Manchester, and then. And I didn't know he'd been out with Chris Evans the night before uh, on the piss. And uh, so he said, Hereford, Manchester, and then he fell asleep. <laughs> and, the, and this young lad, the assistant, said, What do we do now? I said, We bloody wake him up, what do you think we do? Recording snoring. Only time That's it's ever happened to us, though, I think. I love, that, I love that Bez and Sean both lived in Royston Vasey for a while. Well, Hadfield. <laughs> it's so brilliant, that, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Um, so, uh, so um, over the last few years, uh, how has it been? I mean, venues come and go dotted around Manchester, but obviously you're still there, so there, there must be some reason. Is it the engagement with the audience? Is it the understanding of what it makes to provide a space for people or are you picking the right bands or is it a combination of all those things? It's certainly a bunch of all those things. I mean, I think, you know, Jan bought that building, which makes, has obviously made a huge difference. You know, we don't have a landlord and so we don't have to, those kind of onerous conversations every so often about rent. Um, but, but a lot of it is about seeing where things are going and, and knowing what people want to listen to and, and seeing trends. Obviously, the diaries changed quite a bit. I mean, I think historically a lot of those those indie venues it probably was a lot of young white men strumming guitars you know not that that can't be sensational but i think you look at most venues diaries now and they feel more diverse and they feel they're kind of bigger than that now and so that's definitely happened the the, the, the diary is way more diverse than it would have been 10 years ago 
and the age group as well. I've imagined since you were f uh, mm. first there and since it opened, the age the age range has changed. I would imagine. Well, we're still eighteen plus, so it doesn't you know because uh, the city doesn't really want us to let children in. But um, uh, but what? Yeah, I think what you weirdly, I think what you're seeing is older people coming to see what would normally have been shows that had a younger province. That's the change, I think. That you're kind of seeing people in the 60s getting into new bands and who are still kind of going out. Yeah, I don't know. Is anyone else finding that? Nick, are you finding that? There are people that the tastemakers are, are changing. The age of the tastemaker is changing. And the, some of the gigs you put on sale that you think this will be hipster kids is actually a completely different audience to the one you're imagining. Oh, turn yeah. Nick's mic on. <laughs> Someone? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, th that older crowd element is definitely there. The I was told last year that the average age of a festival attendee in the UK was uh, 38. There's a lot of young kids out there, but there's also a lot of people whose kids have grown up who's remembered that what they used to do was going to see bands. And a lot of those guys are the guys investing to see shows in, in grassroots music venues, for sure. Yeah, yeah I mean, certainly. The, um, my, um, uh, it's, it's in my one-man show, this. I did some... I was getting some merch done, and uh, the guy who was making the T-shirts uh, told me this amazing story. You take um, the Black Keys, for example, and he said the Black Keys first tour, and they got you know the usual array of T-shirts made, uh, and after four days of the first tour, uh, they were they had sold out of extra large and large, and they hadn't sold a single small T-shirt. <laughs> which I think possibly endorses this point that the tastemakers are not the waif-like hipsters of Hoxton, ladies and gentlemen. They are uh, men are all, and women of all ages, I think, now. But that's, yeah, that's true, that's changed. And in the, uh, has, can any, I don't know if anyone's identified uh, this in these uncertain times. Um, people, the, the actual spend, is it different? Do you think people are worried about, has the current economic climate, has that hampered putting on gigs? Um, I mean, obviously, we're all terrified. Right. But it doesn't seem to have had that much effect, to be fair. It still seems like people are going out. Maybe they're, uh, maybe they're just waiting to see what happens. Yeah. Well, we all are, aren't we, really? Yes. <laughs> what would, what, is there anything that would help you in your position with, at the night, night and day? Anything which would make life easier? Mm. I mean, I mean we, we seldom see members of the city council come to, come to shows, you know. I, I wonder if they even... Uh, how much, how, many, how much they spend on music and live music and recorded music and downloads and things. It'd be quite nice to kind of get in a room with them all and say, what's your favourite band? What's the last record you bought? It'd be fascinating, wouldn't it? Yeah. Brothers in Arms. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah. Steve, I, I've got a fun thing. I'm always thinking about all the guys of a certain age who are spending, you know, 20, 30 grand on really advanced hi-fi. I'm like, and they're like, because it sounds just like the bands in the room. I'm like, mate, how many tickets could you have bought to see a band see in a band fucking actually room? Actually, in the room. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, Jay Taylor from uh, Night and Day, by the way, everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs> no. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, could we could we have a microphone for Sam as well? Oh, you got one? Everyone got one? Okay, brilliant. Um, right, we're, we're... Oh, yeah, right, sunny south coast next. Here we go. Uh, right, uh, from the Green Door store, uh, this... Uh, so it's uh, Tony Co. Brooker and Amber France, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, round of uh, Again, there's people who uh, that, um, maybe have been to the Great Escape and been to your venue, or maybe been down to Brighton. If they haven't, when you walk in, what do you see? What's, how do you describe it? Um, so we exist in the uh, three arches underneath Brighton train station, um, and it just looks a bit like an underground like Berlin club, I'd say. A um, big it, square box, right? Like, made of concrete. <laughs> when, when um, tell us the history of it. Then, when did it? When did it start? What was it before? It was. Um, it's known as the Green Door Store because it used to be railway storerooms for the, right. the engineers for the railway station, and um, it had three green doors. And um, that used to be also former stables from when the area was lower, working goods yards. And how did you get hold of the premises then? What? It was really, really hard. Um, our parent landlord was Network Rail, 
and then Southern Rail was our direct landlord. And it took us two years to get a lease out of them. Did it? And it was touch and go as to whether we were actually going to get it all the way up until the end. It took like 28 days to get an answer from any solicitor or anything like that. It was actually um, an exercise in dedication to sort of trying to, trying to get it. We, we just saw the vision for it and knew that's, that it had to be that, you know. And how are they as landlords now? Sorry? How are they as landlords now? Are they still your landlord? Um, they're, they, they're okay if we just kind of get on with it, but um, we get, obviously, our rent increases every five years. And we've got one coming up next year. Um, yeah, so slightly worrying, because the last, the last one they tried to put the rent up by 100%. So, yeah, it's quite frightening. Oh, that's, um, that's even more than the tickets. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is a, there's a lot of venues in Brighton, and I don't know whether that works in your favour or against you, whether, it, whether you feel that with a number of venues... Well, I think, it, yeah. I think it works. I think it's great for the city. Um, when we first opened, um, everyone was saying, don't do it, um, because Brighton was kind of on its knees at that time. There were a lot of venues that were actually closing down, and there was a real kind of feeling in the town of kind of you know, quite despair about that happening to Brighton. And um, everyone's kind of like, oh, it's a recession, you know, it's, don't do it, it'd be, you know, it's such a gamble. And that made us more determined. We were like, this is exactly why we have to do it. This is exactly why we have to kind of get it open and get, you know, get Brighton having kind of, you know. And as a result, it's brilliant because lots more venues have opened up in Brighton. It's become, you know, much more... Um, vibrant for the music scene, yeah, so which is so great. It's ended up, so it's, they all complement each other. Yeah, absolutely. Competition, yeah, yeah. yeah. When you say, we, we, I mean, obviously, if everyone's saying don't do it, don't do it, why did you want to do it so much? It just, I don't know, it was just so inspiring as a space. I mean, the building is really the star of the show, I think, you know, and how it works as a venue, it just, it just feels so right. It, you know, my husband and I saw the vision for it and didn't even need to kind of discuss anything about it. We just kind of knew what it would be and it, luckily for us, it has, you know, it's delivered. It's, um, and does, uh, did, the sort of the, did the vision, did that also translate to the sort of music and the events and the ethos of the place then? Ab yeah, absolutely. I mean, and more so. I mean, it's, it's morphed into more, I think, than we ever thought it would be. We've got a youth-led radio station, uh, not-for-profit, that we have built a platform up, like a little, its own little platform that broadcasts from the venue. Um, we have got a radio station. Yeah, it's got an FM license as well. Yeah. What the government gave up an FM license? <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. Platform so, B. Wow, that's a that's yeah. of. Um, did, was that your idea or did somebody come to you and say, and say oh, you know what this venue needs, it needs a radio station? <laughs> um, yeah, it was a bit like that, actually. Yeah. Was it? Yeah, it was. Um, so we were friends with the people that run Juice Radio, um, which is a great radio station in Brighton, and um, they just had this idea for wanting to do this youth-led radio station where it was yeah, pretty much run by 18 to 25-year-olds. And um, they basically just uh, share lots of underground music that probably lots of artists we haven't heard of <laughs> and it's brilliant yeah so, there you go when you get floor two done or floor three have you <laughs> thought about when you when you when you renovate what you're going to do with the rest of the building i only mention this because uh, and it never happened but the, um, a, a group of us three or four of us did get quite close down the line to trying to buy the bull and gate in kentish town with the idea, because it's got three or four, it's got three floors above. We were thinking we would turn one of those floors into rooms where bands could stay, you know, and one into a proper office and editing suite or something or a rehearsal room. I mean, the plans were great. I mean, you, you've got a lot you could do, I suppose. Yeah, um, we want a small cinema, a really small cinema, just for like documentary screenings. We want a lot of multi use spaces so they can be an art gallery or they can be just a yoga studio. So the main thing, I think the main word we're going to be using is multi-use. And there's a roof garden up there that's absolutely phenomenal that looks over the top of the market, and the market's a beautiful building. So we want to get that into use. And then the floor above, um, we're looking at 
long-term creative offices and studios to rent, so we'll get some revenue in from them and just things like that. That's amazing. Do you, I mean, do you think it's part of part of what you enjoy or part of what the, your, makes your venue slightly different is the fact that then it's, it's obviously about, well, it's about music and performance, but it's about bringing creative people together, it feels like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's really it's integral to, to the building and, and, the, and the venue. Yeah, the great thing about the radio station is it's brought a whole new audience to the venue as well. Like, we have only just recently had a resurgence of, um, like, hip-hop and R&B and jazz in Brighton because it was always about the punk scene, the psych scene. Um, and, yeah, this, this audience is, like, generally pretty young. Yeah. So it's just brought a whole new group of people that we wouldn't have otherwise had in the space. Yeah. And do you, I mean, um, uh, do you... I suppose being where you are, do you get a lot of music tourists? I always get told, I always get given figures of how much music tourism is worth, but I imagine you get quite a, you, as well as your hardcore, you get quite a transient crowd, do you? Yeah, I think it's mostly transient, to be honest. Is it? Um, yeah, the local council just did some figures recently saying that um, it brings 112 million into the local economy every year of, in tourism. And they gave you all your business right back after that. Oh, yeah, they? yeah. They give us loads of money. Yeah. They, so they appreciated what you were doing <laughs> in advertising Brighton and uh, fulfilling people's yeah, holidays. I mean, it's, um, I suppose that, I mean, Mark um, always uh, says, doesn't he, that uh, just, every, I mean, every town centre's kebab shop would close if there wasn't a live music venue. No one goes, no one goes home and makes themselves a kebab, <laughs> which I think is very good. <laughs> Very good point. You, uh, do, you, do you get much feedback from your audience, um, uh, the ones who come you know, more than once? Do you, do you get a lot in terms... Do people actually stop and say, oh, you should put this band on or this band? Um, I'd say most of our feedback are from bands, to be honest. They, just, they love coming and playing and um, they're just always recommending us to new bands. Um, we've noticed a massive influx in like, Google reviews recently which is really odd. I now get like notifications every day saying, you've got another review saying, you know, the venue's amazing, but like sort out your toilets. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> do, you, do you find, do you get requests, Nick, for, from, from the Viking or whoever it is, uh, somebody from some of your core regulars saying, when are you getting so-and-so up here, or have you thought about this? Yeah, and they're definitely the people to listen to when it happens as well. I, the, the venue being so small, when, when I run a show, I'm on the cash desk as well, the repping or whatever, so I get to know at least the faces, if not very well, the names of people. And yeah, I mean, if, if you get any requests in your direction, you absolutely try and have a chat with everyone, because they will tell you what they want to see as well. And like, I don't have time to discover everything that's going to have a going to sell some tickets as well, so anyone throws anything at me, I'm at least going to listen to it and find out whether or not it's something we want. Yeah. And, some, and some of the good stuff has come from recommendations as well. I love a venue which is like a record shop, me as well, you know, that you'll have people, that you, you can go somewhere where you can just have a conversation with people and come away with two or three bands names, and if you're at the similar sort of style geek, you're probably, with somebody else, you're probably... And I definitely get it with the DJ recommendations as well. So, you yeah. know, a lot, of, a lot of my clubbing punters are just younger than me, they know what's going on there. And they'll be saying, why isn't so-and-so playing? Why isn't so-and-so playing? And I'll look it up and I'll find out what we get from there, for yeah. sure. Well, what's um, at the Green Door store, do you specialize in anything particular uh, in terms of gigs? Everything, isn't it? Yeah, we do everything. Um, but I would say that we lean quite into punk. You know, it's, there's a massive punk scene. And, and also, because it's like a concrete room, you need loud music, um, and we do a lot of sort of metal and hardcore as well. Tony likes hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> and well, there's still there's still a punk <coughs> scene in Brighton. Yeah, there? yeah, Isn't it's massive. Um, I'm post punk's huge in Brighton, um, and I, for some reason, never seems to go out of fashion. Um, but we still have a really big psych scene as well. Really? Well, and, and these um, are not just fans, but bands. Because that was the other thing I was going to say, is that it does really feel that as the live scene in Brighton has become more buoyant, so is the local music scene. You can't move, you can't, you can't walk down a street in Brighton for falling over a member of a band who'd just <laughs> been played on Radio X or something in the mid, you know, yeah, in John Kennedy's show. The audience is pretty much made of bands as well, <laughs> so it just becomes a massive mates fest, and there's no sort of like difference between you know, a huge band that can sell out a 10,000 cap and like a band that has like, you know, 
100 followers on Facebook. They all go to each other's shows. It's a really supportive community in Brighton. So, so have you, do you have very young bands coming through your, through your doors, new bands, local bands coming through your doors? Uh, well, I mean, we're 18 plus. Um, we have the same problem in terms of, like, the council's not very supportive of having right. Right. all age shows and stuff. But um, we get a lot of, like, 17-year-olds contacting us, and I'm like, come back when you're 18, and, yeah, we'll definitely get you on the stage. Right. You, um, you previously were at the, amazing, were the, the lovely boiler room. In I Guildford? Was. Yeah, I was. They're actually here in the audience. Oh, bless. <laughs> oh, hello. Hi, uh, front seat. <laughs> front row seat. Um, and what, what were the first things you learnt then once you were involved in um, the live music business? Um, well, I wasn't really in um, programming bands at Boiler Room. I worked in community events. So th the biggest thing I learnt was just building a really good relationship with local people um, and how important that is um, because everyone will probably be aware that um, Boiler Room had a license review. And when we went through that, which was really, really tough, um, the whole of the community supported us. I say us like I'm still there. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's just so important to be engaging with your local community. And um, I mean, I haven't, I haven't really asked everyone else, but when you were starting out, whether there were people, obviously you'd get advice from someone who knew what they were doing. But I think that's really important because sometimes you just need someone to put an arm around your shoulder or a hand on your shoulder and just go, it's fine, this has happened before, this, is not, this, this problem is solvable. Don't you think? It's just you need a mentor, I think, somewhere along the line. Well, I think MVT has kind of become that for everyone in this room. You know, whenever we have a problem now, I know I can just go onto the Alliance page and say, guys, I don't know what to do with this situation. And everyone sort of gives you feedback and reassurance and also there's a really good network of promoters in here or in-house promoters that you can just drop a Facebook message to and yeah everyone's just so helpful you do need that it's a really trying job sometimes <laughs> the other thing when I was reading up about the venue and the gigs and everything that you put on was very much how we're all very conscious now of making safe spaces for people and access for different communities different parts of the audience as well which is something you're very keen on at uh, Green Door Store well, being in Brighton, you know, we're in the gay capital of the UK, so, yeah, you have to be very conscious of it. Um, but we put some gender-neutral toilets in recently, which has been tough to kind of communicate the importance of it to security sometimes. So, um, yeah, we're trying very much to keep developing the venue all the time. Like, we've got this um, cup deposit scheme as well, so that we're not getting rid of single-use plastics anymore. That's been accepted really well in Brighton. So it's just generally kind of progressing all of our policies and moving forward. Um, this, this is really a question for anyone. Um, do you take it personally when no one turns up? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you would, wouldn't you? But you would, though. I mean, it's, but it, it, I mean does it, it properly hurt? When you, particularly if it's a band that you like and you thought, right, I've done everything, I've put the posters up, they're great, everyone's going to see how great they are, and then four people turn up, and I just, oh, I'd be so angry. Do you know, when, it, when a show's bombing, you, you're, you're scared to ask the agent, you know, are, are we really fucking up here? But I've taken to asking the agent, I'm like, am I behind on the tour? How are we actually going on with this one? And a lot of the time, to be friends, we're going, tour is tanking a wee bit, and I'm like, cool. Fine, you know, at least, at least you know. <laughs> no, no, yeah, no. Yeah. You you, they, they know what they're getting, and they're like, can you do extra work? And I'm like, yes, I can. And everyone will work towards the show. But if you feel like you're failing when actually you're just doing the same as everyone else, you know, if you're putting your effort in for some reason, the show's not selling, it's better to get a feel of where you are with, with yeah. where everything is sitting. Sam, to take it personally? Yeah. I read a thing, um, you know, the saying, like, find a job you love and you'll never work a day in your life and someone adopted it and it said, find a job you love and you'll work incredibly hard, take everything personally and fall out with everyone you know. And that's... <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, and uh, um, the future for the Green Door Store, have you got, big, uh, have you got future plans? Uh, are there things that you would like to do next? Apart from obviously keeping it, keeping it going. We've got a really, really big plan, uh, which we can't talk about. <laughs> Sorry. But it will need some support from the council, so who knows? Right. 
I mean, does anyone want to guess? Do you want to give us a clue? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tanya Amber. How are we doing for time? We've got um, our final guest this morning, the most experienced member of our group from a venue which has often been, well, I guess almost used as a shorthand for grassroots venues. Uh, and it obviously was uh, started and steered by a man whose uh, experiences in live music promoting were collected together in his book, which was called One Man and His Bog, uh, from Hulls, New Adelphi. Paul Jackson, ladies and gentlemen. How are you? How am I? Yeah. Are you I'm all right? Okay. I, I will apologise for my uh, comfort, comfort break. <laughs> <laughs> Come to, well, trust me, I, I understand. Yeah. We've all been there. Ne yeah. If this goes on more than another 10 minutes, then Nick's doing the rest of this. Um, it's, I, it is quite a common thread these days in live music, people talking about inclusivity you know, the, and then the whole idea of fostering a community open to anyone. But this is one of the things that actually spurred you into opening your venue in the first place back in 1984. 1st of October 1984, yeah. Um, I love music, I love musicians, I love people, I love their life experiences, so put them all under the roof of the Adelphi, and that's my expensive indulgence. So, it's a so you're <laughs> as, uh, um, the landlord of my favourite pub near the BBC says uh, <laughs> that uh, the success of his pub is all down to the fact that he is merely is nothing more than social glue. And in a way, that, that's a, a great venue, is social glue, isn't it? It brings people together. Uh, it is. We certainly have built a, a community around the Adelphi, and it's um, it's ended up spreading around the world like a nasty rash. You know, I always introduce this sort of cosmopolitan um, aspect to the Adelphi. The reason for that is when I started in 1984, um, the city was characterised by low horizons. It was actually quite unusual to see a coloured face or hear an accent you didn't understand. And uh, I, I'd spent, I was expelled from school, so I didn't have an academic career, but through the 70s and the 80s, all the great gigs happened at universities, so I was spending a lot of my time um, in the company of students. And um, the Adelphi, when I opened it, was very much inspired by the cosmopolitan, inclusive environment that I found in the students' unions. And the initial idea was that uh, I introduce that uh, to the Adelphi and integrate that with successive generations of six formers. This is all alongside the music, yeah. but, uh, but there's always been this accompanying um, social agenda uh, beside the music, which I think is really important. Yeah. And you, the venue, again, I mean, in, in your case, I think even if people haven't been there, they probably know something about it, or, or at least they know that it's a terraced house. It is. It looks like a derelict building inside and out. It, it always did, and it still does, yeah. <laughs> How did you end up... What was it before? Was it, it was Working Man's Club, was it, when you took it over? Uh, the Adelphi originally opened in 1918 as um, a Working Man's Club. It was called the Victory Club. It was immediately after victory in the First World War was uh, declared, and it was just a single house at that time. Um, the car park was created by the Luftwaffe in the Second World War. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, I mean, being, I mean, the first time I went to the Adelphi, I did that classic thing where I walked down the street, walked right past it, and then had to come back, uh, where we loads everyone. But, obviously, now, conjuring up that image in my head, how do you get on with the neighbours? We get on pretty fine. 
Um, yeah, you know, we've had the odd problem with owner occupiers wanting to boost the value of their own property investment, but uh, the council have been pretty good. I mean, both the council and police have doorstepped the surrounding air area and asked residents their views on the Adelphi, and everybody has been very supportive of the place. Really, they, the council have been around knocking on doors, saying, yeah. excuse me, I'm from the council, what do you think of the, yeah. the new yeah, Adelphi? Yeah. Yeah, no, they've been very supportive. We, we've got a pretty good relationship with, with the council. Um, I mean, a council is a, a many-headed monster, really, and there are one or two areas where we don't get on quite so well, but generally speaking, our relationship is, is very good. And we have a very good relationship with the police as well. Do you, you've been in this game a very long time. Do, do, do you think... Um Live music is a cyclical thing. It naturally goes through peaks and troughs. And there will be times where you just have to get through the bit at the bottom because it will get better again a year or two later. Um, it's never easy. Um, it's always been a struggle. And I think we've... I don't know. I, th I think we've ma maintained our, by maintaining our founding principles, as I say, the music agenda accompanied by a social agenda, I, I, I think that's sort of self-regenerating, really. Um, I think it stood us in good stead for 35 years, and um, it will probably stand the Adelphi in good stead after I'm gone. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think it can survive um, beyond me. It certainly doesn't need me these days. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, have you noticed uh, the uh, sort of the comings and goings? Because in some cases, a, a different musical wave will come along, which is essentially you, you, one which you have to see live. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the glorious thing about music venues, isn't it? That it can't really be uh, that, that energy exchange that we all find like kind of thrilling, it, how it happens, th the things that happen on stage may change, but that thing's gonna stay the same because you need to be in a room with the energy coming off the stage and you catch it and you throw it back. And, and so that's kind of quite pure, isn't it? Yeah, and I think, well, there were just certain venues will definitely have their time or certain, you know, live music, I think does have its, have its moments. I mean, when, I don't know, the Libertines and the Arctic Monkeys came along, for instance, mm. and then that's, you know, I mean, I know in the end all these bands sounded the same, but there was something brilliant about just that, that wave of bands and you know people going out to see them. You had the Art Two Monkeys at Night and Day Cafe. Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Opening for Kaiser Chiefs, weirdly. Really? Yeah. Right. There's so, but, but it does some of those some of those times. You just think, well, this is a this is a gift. Really. I mean, it, people always because the venue's been there quite a long time. People always ask, oh, let's talk about the things that happened in the past. I always refuse. So I'd rather talk about Friday. You know. Well, it's just more interesting to me. It's, uh, I'm granted, yeah. you know, I'm not selling tickets for 1995, you know, I'm selling tickets for tonight and onwards. But also, I'm genuinely more interested in what's happening tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. I don't know, one of the things, I, I was thinking about this, though, because um, when I started going to the Adelphi two or three times uh, a year was at that point where grunge happened and then there was a whole wave of, British bands like the Mega City Four and Senseless Things, and it just it felt for a while that a lot of those groups helped reju rejuvenate the interest in in the grassroots circuit at that point at the end of the 80s, start of the 90s. Uh, it was a change. I, I I can identify with your cyclical thing um, completely, but I tend to see it a little bit differently. Um, I tend to sort of split music as an art form into groups, you know, looks a bit like a sandwich in which the top slice is <laughs> um, the mainstream, commodified, mainstream, radio-friendly music, nothing more than two and a half, three and a half minutes long, the stuff that doesn't actually work very well live. Um, the traditional 
music forms are the bottom slice, nothing much happens down there. They're well supported if you want to go to a classical gig or a jazz concert or festival, stuff like that. But the filling that makes the sandwich worthwhile is the underground. It's the place where musicians meet and fuck about and experiment and take music forward as an art form. And I think we're looking at a sandwich at the present time with very little in the way of filling. Yeah, you know, I'm talking about, yeah, you know, we're very well catered for uh, in terms of radio friendly music between two and a half and three and a half minutes long. But it's the, it's the music that goes beyond four minutes, that goes to seven, 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes or more. It's the instrumental music. Um, you're, you're talking about uh, the creation of albums that you can listen to as a single uninterrupted piece of music. You, you know, that, that's most under threat at the moment. And, um, you, you know, to, to me, the greatest audience response, I mean, it's great to see people having a, a good time, but to me, the greatest audience response is to stand at the front and see an audience in tears. Not because they've wasted a tenor or whatever, but because they're overcome by the beauty of what they're seeing or they're overcome in any number of ways. And to me, that's the greatest audience response of all and it's, part of, and it's part of my job to give people memories that will stay with them for the rest of their life you know I, I, I want them to be inspired and we try and do that and and it's those interesting forms of music the forms of music that are a lot more interesting than solely radio friendly commodified music it's those types of music I worry about. I think they're severely under threat at the moment. And, uh, and also, I suppose it's, uh, particularly the, the Adelphi, I think, um, it's important that there's, there's a stage for young musicians to be able to go and do their thing and find themselves. So there is a, I mean, the whole music scene is very healthy at the moment, and that's partly down to yourselves. We, we do all that. We have organised... Um, shows for um and, and tuition and rehearsals for um 14 to 18 year olds nowadays um but uh, it's always been a a place where bands could start and they get all the encouragement and advice and contacts that they need we're, we're very supportive in that respect yeah. uh, and and uh, so while doing that and i mean you do put on bands on tour and everything but you you have a slightly different relationship with agents to some venues. Um, yeah, I don't think any agent would want to deal with me these days, actually. <laughs> uh, they, they would find it very, very confusing because we, we, we tend to do things our way. Um, and that doesn't mean we do it badly. But uh, uh, I worked with agents for many, many years and uh, it was great fun. But uh, um, we, we try to do it from time to time, but uh, no, I don't. I, I, I like so to you, do things you, my way. <laughs> you just do it yourself and do it deal direct with bands these days rather than agent. Um, well, we do tend to do a lot of sort of DIY type bands, yeah, yeah, you know, um, who tend to represent music as an art form. Um, well, a lot of bands do ring me up direct, and, and they know they'll be looked after well. And, yeah, treated fairly, you know. And what what's the future of the new Adelphi? What's the next chapter? Um, it's always a question of feeling your way. Uh, we've got a team of a very talented team of voluntary directors. We're now uh, enjoying CIC status. Whether that will actually ever enable us to access funding, I don't know. I've become increasingly disillusioned with funding criteria over recent months. Um, I honestly think we'd have to dumb down if we were to sort of uh, achieve any funding support. And uh, I'm also quite worried about the effects of the uh, Arts Council's 
ten-year plan that's uh, on the point of being published. I, I, I think the role of music is being diminished quite rapidly, and uh, I feel quite strongly about that. Well, that's why you're still here, Paul, fighting those, fighting those, fighting those battles for us and giving a stage. As I say, the most one of the most important things you can do and have done. You know, from uh, through the House Martins and Kingmaker and all those, those that wave of bands our whole like, life at the moment yeah. is give them a stage and let them be themselves. And uh, that's why I will always salute the terraced house that is the new Adelphi. Paul Jackson, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um,